Hey everyone, this is Onya. This is our sixth video on the Book of Jubilees, specifically the Bible study number five. And in this one, we dive deeply into the whole issue of the genealogies. As some of you may know, the versions of the genealogy in Genesis chapter 5 and 11 differ radically in the three different uh, versions of Genesis. It's uh, Masoretic, Samaritan, and Septuagint. They all differ radically. Jubilees adds evidence to that discussion in the Samaritan's favor, at least partially. Uh, for the first half, for Genesis chapter 5, Jubilees agrees entirely with the Samaritan version, whereas in the Genesis chapter 11, Jubilees doesn't agree with any of the three witnesses, so it provides corroboration with the Samaritan for at least Genesis chapter 5. But I go into that in great detail in this video, and I think it's, and I discuss the implications and significance of, of those differences in the accounts. So I hope you enjoy that, that information. Uh, this, now I'm going to talk about the Patreon support, so if you want to skip that, feel free to do so. I currently have two supporters. One is donating $25 a month, and the other is donating $10 a month. The $25 a month donator is um, Daniel Simpson, and the other donator of $10 a month is Aliyahu. That's the name he goes by. Now, if you want to support what I'm doing, you can do through Patreon or through any other number of methods such as Facebook, Google, or PayPal. And really, any any method that sends me money would be fine. If you now here, there are rewards for if you reach different levels of of reward. If you do one dollar every month, I will mention you in my videos as a supporter of mine, as well as in future publications of the Bible that I do. I will also mention it list you in a dedication page. If you do $10 every month, I will guarantee a Google Hangouts conference with you once a, once a month, If or a video, video conference in general. If you don't have Google Hangouts, I can do another video platform, like Facebook Video or some other platform. Some people like to use Zoom or Skype, I can do either of those as well. Then you twenty five dollars a month is uh, two Google Hangouts conferences a month. Fifty dollars a month is four Google Hangouts a month. One hundred dollars a month is I will visit you for a twenty four hour period once a year. Two hundred fifty dollars a month I will visit you for twenty four hour period twice a year. $500 a month, I will visit you for a 24 hour period three times a year, and and uh, $1,000 a month, I will visit you for a 24 hour period for f four times a year. So uh, those are the reward levels, and if you guys have any advice or recommendations to change or alter or add different levels of reward, uh, feel free to do so. You can message me or comment in any of the videos saying your preference for a change in the reward levels. Uh, for example, if you feel like you can do a certain level of of donation, but you don't want to miss out on a higher level of reward, we can discuss that as well. Like, say you want to, me to visit you. Um, like the, the one that's $100 a month, I'll visit you for a 24 hour period once a year. Well, if you live very close to me, then we can discuss the possibility of a, a lesser amount, uh, like only 
$75 a month, I'll visit you for a 24 hour period once a year. Things like that. We can discuss uh, discounts for special uh, cases, or we could discuss completely revamping the entire reward structure for everybody. That's something that I'm open to. If people are wanting wanting that, they can definitely discuss that with me. So anyways, that's the uh, that's my video, and I hope you have, uh, I mean not my video, my, my intro to the video, and uh, I hope you enjoy this video on my, on the study of the Book of Jubilees. God bless you guys. I think I am recording. I'm recording. So um, today we have uh, Onya Carlson. He's going to continue talking about Jubilees. I'm not sure where you left off, but this is a multi-part uh, uh, discussion and and uh, conversation that we're having. So um, if you want, uh, Onya, if you want to summarize where you left last left off. Well, we basically got right up to right before the time of Abraham. We, we left off with, uh, I was discussing Serug and we, we kind of were, were in that, we were in that period right before the time of Abraham coming onto the scene. So we were finishing off Noah's life and we were pretty much at that, that point. Okay. And I think this might be the sixth video series on Jubilees we were doing. Uh, the fifth or the sixth. We, we've been doing a, 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 a bunch for a while. Mm -hmm. But that's good because it's, you know, it's a, it's a pretty big book uh, comparable to the size of Genesis and Exodus. Like, you know, so, um, so it's going to take a while to go through the whole book. But I'm trying to go through it in a way that, brings benefit to people. I mean, Jackson mentioned the other day, the other week, uh, he, whenever he tries to dive into Jubilees, he gets bored by it or something along those lines. Um, so it can help to have someone like me who explain the basic, the, the most interesting things. Um, Actually, you go, go really deep, Andrew. Yeah, I try listen to him and editing them for the radio. Oh yeah, Jackson. I I've sometimes uh, in previous videos I've done there were there were a few times where I did like really long teachings and that must have been torture for Jackson to have to to have to edit through through it and listen to the whole thing. Um, we we try to be pretty good on time now. We try to stick to what an hour or anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half. We try not to go longer than that so um but uh yeah I, I do try to i go i try to go deep into it but in a way that that people find interesting and today i, I try to go off an outline i try to make an outline for the, the teachings i'm going to be doing and i didn't have the time to to go through Abraham's life uh, and make an outline of Abraham's life of the of the topics to discuss for that, but I did plan for something else this time, and it's kind of along the lines of what we discussed the whole thing of uh, of like it's kind of like a, a oh, hold on let's say sure I get everything here okay so. on the topic of like what is considered boring you know what what bores people uh one of the most boring passages in the bible would be the genealogies have any of you guys pretty much like you know when it comes to genealogies you're like okay let's just skip over that stuff that's kind of boring material if you I'll, look I'll, at it closely you always find a skeleton in the closet Yes. Well, there, yeah, there is always interesting things there, but I think when you are younger, like, yeah, this is boring. But as you get older and you get into this more, you see that there is obviously a purpose for them. Like in the Genesis 10 and 11, 
for example, the genealogies there show a lot, you know, for the uh, coming uh, world setup. And, uh, you know, you look at that and you can see all of that. Yeah. And um, as a scribe, I take a lot of joy in the very tiny details of scripture. Most people are not scribes, so they don't have the same appreciation of nuances necessarily. Um, but it's my job as a scribe. You know, there's, there's warnings in scripture of, you know, the Messiah, he spoke negative things of the scribes. And that's because the scribes had the task to properly preserve and present scripture to people. But instead, the scribes were twisting it, corrupting it, and changing it to support what they wanted it to say. So it's an important task, but it also is a great responsibility that needs to be handled uh, seriously. And I try to do that. And so today, I decided we were going to go through the genealogies because that's the perfect, that's basically where we left off. That's right where we can, that's a perfect transition to talk about the genealogies from where we currently are in our study of Jubilees. So we're going to dive into some of the important things that we can learn from the genealogy, particularly when it comes to completely rewriting our understanding of biblical history. How many of you have heard that, for example, that the oldest man who ever lived was Methuselah? 969 years old, they say. I think that's pretty fairly accepted, at least from most translations, yes. According to Jubilees and other copies of Genesis, that's actually not the case. Methuselah was not the oldest man. The oldest man was actually Noah at 950 years old. And Methuselah died at a much younger age. And so we're going to go through some of that today and show that the current understanding of the genealogy is actually quite, quite uh, contrary to what the original was. Now, when you go through Genesis, you'll see it'll say, like, let me, let me pull it up. Just, I won't read every single one, uh, but I'm just going to read Adam. Or, let's see, I'll, I'll, read, uh, I'll read Seth's one, how about? Just to show you the way it's set up. And of course, you guys are familiar with it, but some of the people listening in the recording might not necessarily be familiar with it. So I'll just, I'll, uh, hold on, it's being slow at the moment. If I, for some reason, if my internet cuts me out, I'll, I'll be back in shortly, but hopefully if that doesn't happen, hold on. Um, my computer sometimes gets slow because I have like a hundred tabs open right now and I'm not even exaggerating. Like my problem is I like I open tabs and then I don't want to close them. So they just, they just keep accumulating and then I have like a hundred tabs open at all at the same time. Um, so let's see here. Okay, so I'll give you this example. Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. After he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. So you see how that works. It tells you how old they were when they had their first son, how many years after they lived, and then the total number of years of their life. And does that for each of the sons um, from, from Adam all the way down to Noah. Then you take a look and it says in, it says in um, Genesis chapter 11, it says, I'll give you an example uh, for Selah. Selah lived 30 years and begot Eber. And he begot Eber, excuse me, after he begot Eber, Selah lived 403 years and begot sons and daughters. That's all it says. So wait a minute. Genesis 5 
has has uh, how many years they were when the, when they had their first son, how many years old they were, how many years after their first son they lived, and then it repeats and gives the total how many years they were when they died. But for the, the people after the flood, it doesn't do that. It just says how many year, how old they were when they had their first son and how many years after. It doesn't say how many years they were when they died. But some copies of Genesis do say that. And though that would be the Samaritan Torah. I'll, I'll read uh, one example from the Samaritan Torah. I'll, I'll, so let me read, I'll read the same passage. Um, let me just quickly get to that chapter. Okay, so it was Sheila. All right. Let, let me let me read uh, the, the. I'm going to read the Masoretic passage one more time, what I just read, and then I'm going to and then I'll read that same passage, but from the Samaritan copy, and you're going to see the difference. Okay. So here's from the, from the uh, Masoretic. It says, and Sheila lived thirty years and begot Eber, and Sheila lived three years and four hundred years after he begot Eber and begot sons and daughters. Okay, that's that. Now, that same two verses, but from the Samaritan, read, And Shelah lived 30 years and 100 years, and he begot Eber. And Shelah lived three years and 300 years after he begot Eber, and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Shelah were 330 years and 400 years, and he died. So do you see, you see right there that uh, the, the Samaritan Torah has the extra totals it, it has the verse for the totals which is in harmony with with genesis chapter 5. scribes must have looked at that and be like okay that's we don't need the totals we'll just remove the totals because for example uh if you take basic math you know if you do five plus six equals that equals 11 right well, most people know that, so you don't necessarily need to tell people, oh yeah, it equals 11. So the scribes are like, okay, we don't need to say it equals 11, we'll just say 5 plus 6, and people will figure it out. But it makes sense that the original would have had the totals in there. And so the Samaritan shows an older preservation in harmony with Genesis chapter 5. That's just one of the many examples where we see evidence that, that the genealogies have been altered. Now we're going to get into some of the, the huge differences. One of the biggest differences in the, is in the Septuagint version. For example, it says in the Masoretic that Adam was 130 years old when he had his first son, Seth, or not his first son, his uh, successor. And then it says he lived 800 years after he had his first son, and the total was 930 years. What does the Septuagint say? It says, Adam was 230 years old, and after that, he lived 700 years, and he died at 930 years old. So you see what, do you see there? Both the Masoretic and Septuagint have the total of Adam's life at 930 years. So that cannot be accident. The differences between the Septuagint and Masoretic cannot be accidental. It has to be intentional. The scribes intentionally changed the dates for a specific purpose. We don't know. We need to determine why that is. Why do they do that? So, as an example, I'm just going to read through the numbers here. Adam, 130, when he had his son, Seth, lived 800 years, died at 930. Septuagint, 230, 700 years, 930. Then for Seth, he was 105, according to the Masoretic. He lived 807 years, total 912. Septuagint, he was 205, lived 707 years after, total 912 years. And then again, uh, the next one, 90, 815, 905. Compare that to 
190, 715, total 905. And I'll, and I'll read uh, two more of, on the same, in the same line of thought. 70, 840, total 910. Septuagint, 170, 740, total 910. And this one is, um, let's see, this, who's this one? Uh, Mahalalel, okay, so he was 65, 830 years after, he died at 895. Septuagint says he was 165, 730 years after, the total was 895. So you see that pattern. Masoretic has the lower number when he had the son, has the higher number of how many years after he lived, but the total is the same exact total as the Septuagint total. The Septuagint just subtracts 100 for how many years after and adds 100 for how old he was when he had the son. So this cannot be an accident because if it was an accident, uh, for example, if it was an act, I'm using the example of five plus six equals 11 again, okay? So if it was an accident, if someone accidentally changed five to 15, then it would say uh, 15 plus six equals 11. And you would see that and be like, oh wait, no, 15 plus six does not equal 11, okay. Um, so that would be an accident. But if it, if it was 15 plus six and like, oh wait, that equals 21. Okay, we, we got to change it to say 21 now. Then they might change the total to say 21. But the fact is they didn't change the total to say, it, it didn't change like that. How it changed was the total stayed the same, but the numbers that added up changed. So it'd be like six plus five equals 11. Instead of that, it would be three plus eight. They would change it to three plus eight. That can't be accidental or random. It has to be a scribe who looks at that and like, okay, the total has to be 11. How are we going to change it so that the total is still 11? So you see there, uh, the, the math is too exact. This proves that the scribes either change the Septuagint to shorten it, or they change the Masoretic to add, um, to add years. Now, now, what we have, uh, so let me, let me say the Samaritan Torah agrees with the Masoretic for the first five people. It agrees with Seth's dates, um, Adam's dates, Seth's, Enosh, Kenan, and Mahalalel, the first five that I just went through. Samaritan Torah agrees 100% with the Masoretic. But now, the Masoretic agrees with the Septuagint in the next person. The next person is Jared. In the Masoretic and Septuagint, it says that uh, Jared was 162 years old when they had his son, 800 years after he lived, and he died at 962. So now all of a sudden, the Masoretic is agreeing with the Septuagint. But the Samaritan has the same thing that, like, Earlier, what I said was the Masoretic was 100 less for how old they were when they had the son. Now the Samaritan is 100 less. So Jared was only 62 in Samaritan copies when he had his son. And then not only that, now the total is different, 847. And when we look at the reason the total is different, the reason actually leads to that uh, according to the Samaritan, Jared actually died in the flood. He died, or he either died in the flood or died in the same year as the flood, according to the Samaritan. But the Masoretic and Septuagint, he did not do that. And if you think about it, if, you know, the, the scribes would have thought that, uh, that, Jared was a righteous man. So they would be like, no, Jared would not die in the flood. That, that wouldn't happen. So they'd have a, they would have a motivation to change that. Because the idea that a righteous man died in the flood would, would, not, be, would not make much sense. Um, so they have him in the Septuagint and Masoretic as 962 years. That's the second oldest man 
Samaritan has him as 847 years. So that that's not that's significantly younger than than uh, what we have thought. Now, all three versions, Masoretan, Samaritan, and Septuagint, they agree at Enoch's years. Okay, they agree with Enoch. But now, the, now it starts getting all messed up with Methuselah. Here we have, remember I told you 969 years old is what we've been taught. Septuagint agrees, 969. But now we have, so the Masoretic has Methuselah as 187 years old when he has his son, and he lives 782 years after, total 90, 969. Septuagint has, instead of 187, it has 167. And then it has 802 years after for the total 969. So that's a 20 year discrepancy there for some reason. But now let's look and see. The Samaritan has 67. So the Samaritan is 100 years less than the Septuagint. Septuagint is 167. Samaritan is 67. Remember we talked about earlier about how the Masoretic was 100 years exactly less than the Septuagint consistently for most of the people. And then we, we pointed out that the Samaritan for for Jared is 100 years exactly less. Now we have the Samaritan 100 years less than the Septuagint exactly. But for the Masoretic, it's 120 years less. So that shows the Masoretic is not the original for Methuselah. Methuselah was not 187 years old when he had his son. Because this principle of 100 year difference, that only occurs with the Septuagint and Samaritan for Methuselah. So, based on that fact, if we take Genesis as authority, either Samaritan is the original or Septuagint for this per per specific person, Methuselah. And then it says that Methuselah only lived 653 years after uh, in the Samaritan. So, Septuagint, he was 167, and he lived 802 years, total 969. The Masoretic, 187, he lived 782 years and died at 969. But the Samaritan has it as 67 years old, only lived 653 years after, for a total of 720 years only. He, so according to Samaritan, uh, Methuselah died at the age of 720 years. That's very young. And he died in the same year as the flood. Another thing in Samaritan's favor is we looked earlier. So Adam was 130, Seth 105, and then there was 90, 70, 65. 62 and 65 and 67, that's all in the same line. Like, that's very young. But the Septuagint and Masoretic, Methuselah as super old, like 187 years old when he had his first son, that is highly unlikely. Septuagint, 167 years old when he had his first son. That doesn't make much sense. Samaritan has it at 67. That makes more sense, and it's in line with what we're seeing in the rest of the patriarchs. All the patriarchs were having sons. They start, you know, Adam had the, his son at the oldest, 130, and then it just keeps going lower. Seth, 105, then 90, 70, 65, 62, 65, 67. These are all lower numbers. So it would be very unlikely for it to be 90, 70, 65, 62, 65, 187. Like that's a huge jump and doesn't make sense. So Samaritan is more in harmony with the lower numbers that we're seeing that, that pattern. Now the next one is Lamech. And this one is also all messed up. For Lamech, it's when the Masoretic says 182 years, he lived 595 after for a total of 777 years. People look at that and like, oh, 777 years, that's a special number. The same thing we see like, you know, when people say 666, ah, oh, that's the evil number. Oh. But 
they do the same thing with the number 777. So you can see why a scribe might be motivated to put it to 777. It's like, oh, wow, that's a, that's a very special number. So he probably lived 777 years. In fact, let's see here. Three, four, five, six, seven. No, he's not a seventh person. But um, So that's Lamech. Um, now, for the Septuagint, it's, it's okay. So Masoretic was 182, 595 after. Septuagint, it is 188 plus 565 for a total of 753. That's 34 years younger than the Masoretic. But now he's in another example of the Samaritan having a hundred less than the Septuagint. It says Lamech was 53 years old when he had a son. He lived 600 years after for a total of 653. So you know how we talked earlier that the totals are usually the same, but it's the how old they were when they had a son that's 100 years less, right? Well, in this example, it's actually the, the total that's 100 years difference from the Septuagint and Samaritan. So now Septuagint has Lamech as 753 years old when he died. Samaritan has him as 653 years, 100 years less. So uh, this again, in the Samaritan, it makes him die in the year of the flood. So you have, again, the, the consistency, the, the younger years, 53 instead of a, a super high number, 182 or 188, that's just con contrary to the lower numbers principle that we're seeing in Genesis. And um, yeah, so that's the major differences. So now, with all that said, how does, it, how does that relate to Jubilees? Well, Jubilees, surprisingly, has agreement with the Samaritan Torah. So... Jubilees has 130. Um, it actually, Jubilees does it a little differently. Jubilees doesn't tell you how old they were. It tells you what year from creation it was. But we can use in, in Genesis, we can add the numbers up to, to tell us what year the creation it was. So for, from the creation it was. So for example, it says Seth was 105 years old when he had his son. Enosh, but it says that Adam was 130 years old when he had his son Seth. So we take that and say, okay, 130 years old was when Seth was born. Add 105 when Enosh is born. So now you have Enosh being born at 235 years old, uh, 235 years after creation. And you keep doing that and you add it up, and that's how you find out when the flood is. So according to the Masoretic, the flood is. 1,656 years after creation. According to the Septuagint, it is, I believe it's 2,252 years. And the, the Samaritan is only 1,308 years after. So those are radically different. Samaritan and Masoretic are closer, but they're still 300, 300 years off from each other. But so Jubilees comes into the rescue and actually reveals to us the truth, what the original was. Uh, and so the original, we, we see that it is, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the numbers of, of Jubilees here. So as I said, it does it a little differently. It does it, instead of saying how old they were, and another thing is, Genesis tells us how old they were when they died, or how many years after they lived. Ge um, Genesis says that. Jubilees does not tell us that. Jubilees does not tell us how old they were when they died, and how many years after. So whoever wrote Genesis had to get that information from another source. They either got it from Genesis Apocryphon, or, as I argue, there's evidence, we can go through this next week's teaching, um, there's evidence of another book of Jubilees that once existed, which gave more information about genealogy and stuff. And so I do believe that Genesis derived its genealogical information from this other Jub Jubilees book that once existed. Um, but So Jubilees doesn't give us the, all the same numbers, like how many years after and how old they were when they died, but it does give how, how many years from creation when each person was born. So what it tells us is 
Seth was born 130 years after. Agrees with, uh, so for the first five, it agrees with the Samaritan and the Masoretic. So the first five are 130, 235, 325, 395, Oh, the, those are the first four, um, but Adam was year zero or year one. So those are the first five. So zero, 130, 235, 325, 395, okay? Um, then, now we have the discrepancy. Remember, um, let's see here. Okay, so now we have... If we add up the numbers, okay, so Jared was born, Masoretic and Samaritan agree, Jared was born when Mahalo was 65 years old. But when we add up the numbers, we say, oh, okay, when you add up the numbers, that's 460 years after creation. But according to Jubilees, it was in the 461st year. Okay, so let me explain why there's the discrepancy of the one year. So, um, let's see how, how to best explain it. Um, so when, when it says that Adam was 130 years old, it doesn't say if he was 130 years old in one day or 11 months, was he 130 years old in like a, a week extra, or was he almost 131 years old, but slightly below it. And for each person, it's like that. How old was Seth? Was he basically 105 or was he almost 100 and, excuse me. Uh, yeah, it's 100. Was he almost a 105 when he had Enosh or was he almost, or was he almost 106? We're just told in Genesis he was 105, but was it right near 105 or was it very close to 106? You know, I'm, uh, let's see, I am 27, I think. Uh, yeah, 27. Um, I had my birthday back in March, but I'm, st I'm still going to be 27 when it's in February, one month before my birthday. So the, the reason is Genesis doesn't tell us how many months they were when they had the sun. So that's why you can see discrepancies over time in different sources that count it differently. Jubilees doesn't count it how old they were. Jubilees counts it um, how many years from creation. So that's why there's this discrepancy here. If you add the numbers, because there's no months in, in Genesis, we have Jared being born 460 years after, but Jubilee tells us, no, it was actually in the 461st year. Um, so next we have, when was Enoch born? According to Samaritan, he was born 522 years after. That agrees with Jubilees. So, uh, Masoretic has 622 years. And then we go to Methuselah. Samaritan says he was 587. That agrees with Jubilees. Masoretic says 687. So again, uh, Jubilees is siding with Samaritan there. Next, we have, um, we have Lamech. According to um, according to the Samaritan, it was 654 years. Um, and the uh, Masoretic, it was 874 years. So now that's a discrepancy of 220 years difference from the Masoretic. Um, for some reason, I did not write down in Jubilees. Uh, I did not write down the Jubilees date. So let me quickly get the Jubilees date. So that's, let's see, where are we here? That's for when Lamech was born. Let me just get that date. I forgot to put that there. Um, let's see. Um... Okay, it's 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 formatted formatted weird here. Um, I'm gonna look in Vandercam's. As I mentioned before, Vandercam has a translation of Jubilees. I have 
the file in the Yahad group so people can view that. Um, let me just get it. Let me just close Vander Cam's file, the exact year. Okay, so Lamech was born 652 years after. So now we have another discrepancy of the example of the months thing. Okay, so if you add the years up without knowing what the months are, it looks like Lamech was born 654 years after creation. But according to Jubilees, he was born in the 652nd year after creation. So again, the, the difference is there. It shows that uh, it's because of the months. It doesn't tell us the months for the patriarchs. That's why there's that discrepancy. And in many times in scripture, it rounds up, so or rounds down. So if if I was if I was um, if I was twenty seven years old and eleven months old, the Bible might count me as twenty eight years old because they're like, oh, you're pretty much twenty eight years old. We'll just say you're twenty eight. They round up. They also round down. If it's like a few months, they'll round down to. So if I was twenty seven and three months old, they would round down to twenty seven years. So that's what we see happening in Genesis. It removes the months entirely and rounds up or rounds down. Um, so those are some major differences right there. But Jubilees consistently agrees. Now we have, when was Noah born? Noah was born in the, in the uh, Samaritan, 707 years old. I mean, 707 years after uh, creation, that agrees with Jubilees. But um, Masoretic has Noah being born nearly, let's see, um, 350 years later. So according to Masoretic, that's a 350-year gap. That's a huge difference. Um, but again, as I said, Samaritan agrees with Jubilees. So... And let me just read the, the, the years. This is what the Septuagint has. Um, all right, let, let me see. I'll go, I'll go one, I'm going to go very quickly once more through the Samaritan slash Jubilees numbers of how many years after creation, okay? This is going to be very quick. So Adam, zero. Then uh I'm not going to say the names, but 130, 235, 325, 395, 460, 522, 587, 654, 707, okay? And 1209. 1209 would be when, when, uh, when Shem was born. All right, so those are the numbers there. Now we take a look at the Septuagint numbers of how many years of the creation, and it's wildly different. So it's 0, 230. 435, 625, 795, 960, 1122, 1287, 1454, 1642, 2144. Uh, so that's huge. So Samaritan and Jubilees have Shem born 1,209 years after creation. Septuagint has Shem born 2,144 years after creation. Huge difference. And that's because Septuagint adds extra 100 years each time. Um, so Septuagint adds like an extra 1,000 years there, as you can see. So now some might say, well, Jubilees agrees with Samaritans. So that shows that Jubilees is unreliable because the Samaritans are evil and if Jubilee sides with the Samaritans, that means Jubilees is evil too. You might hear someone argue that. It actually means quite something different. What it means is that the Samaritans had a more accurate Torah than we have realized. Did you want to say something, Jackson? Yeah, I just had a question right there. I had to jump up out of bed. Is there any inkling in Jubilees in regard to these, these uh, uh, birth years? or the huge amounts, or any kind of clue, see if those are coded or anything like that? 
You mean that, so like a special, like a, a hidden deeper meaning? Well, yeah, because you say the numbers are different there than in Genesis and other places. And so, where, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think, is there a common tradition here on these? Evidently not. And uh, do they really mean 750 years or 960 years? Or they, do they mean something else? Take Enoch, for instance. I think his, his is 360. With 365. 365. Obviously, that's a piece of code right there. I just wondered if there was any more elucidation in that book on that. Um, Jubilee doesn't appear to present it as having any special meaning. I think with Enoch, it might have been a special significance to kind of be a sign that you know Enoch was the Enoch was the special chosen one for the calendar and things like that. So I think I think the creator knew what he was doing and was kind of like being smart and took Enoch when he was three hundred sixty-five years old as a sign. Enoch is a testimony to you all. Um, for all these other ones, I mean, for the Masoretic, you have 777 years. That's a, some people argue that's a sign, but, um, as I suggested, I think Jubilees and Samaritan show that the 777 year thing is not accurate. Um, you, you would definitely see, like, people want to make sense out of randomness. So the scribes want to make sense out of these numbers, so they would be more motivated to, to change it to make it special meaning like a scribe would be more likely to change this to 777 because that is than to say no nah, let's change it from 777 to a random number um but so and and uh as i i did mention however that three of the people uh according to jubilees they lived to when the flood was and died in the same year as the flood so that would be that would be uh, Jared, Methuselah, and Lamech. Three of the patriarchs all died in the same year, according to the Samaritan and Jubilees. Masoretic and Septuagint doesn't agree with that. So um, that's the significance there. That uh, when, what year do they die? Um, and then there's also significance of like how old they were when they overlap, because for example, According to according to the Septuagint, Noah Noah was born. Uh, let's see. Noah was born a thousand six hundred forty two years after after uh, creation, according to the Septuagint. So that means that according to the Septuagint, let's see. Um, so, so uh, 1,642 years, so that means, that means Noah was not alive, like, basically Adam, Seth, Enosh, and Kenan all died before, before Noah was born. And not only that, Enoch was taken away before Noah was even born. Okay. Um, According to um, according to the Samaritan, however, we have Noah being born seven hundred and seventy years after seven hundred and seven years after creation. That means Noah was alive, Adam was still alive, um, and every one of every one of Noah's ancestors was still alive. Enoch was not removed, Enoch was still there. And that agrees with the Book of Enoch, because we know in the Book of Enoch, Enoch was still there when Lamech had his son, Noah, and he's like, oh no, my son's born, and I'm not sure if it's mine. I'm going to go ask Methuselah to help and see if he's truly my son or not. That story is not possible um, with the Septuagint chronology, because in the Septuagint, Enoch is a much, Enoch's already taken away. But in Samaritan and Jubilees, Enoch hasn't been taken away yet. And Enoch, in the book of Enoch, he hasn't been taken away yet. So that is a very, Enoch agrees with the Samaritan and Jubilees chronology. And the book of Enoch also has Adam, uh, it has Adam, let's see, um, 
Let's see. Uh, let, me, let me just check the mass reddit for a sec here. Um, okay. But yeah, so. Um, oh, okay. And the mass reddit also does not agree because Noah was, was born 1,056 years after creation in the Masoretic, but Enoch was taken 987 years after. But again, as I said, according to the book of Enoch and Genesis Apocryphon, Enoch was still here and was not taken away yet when Noah was born. That only agrees with the Samaritan and Jubilees chronology. So that is a very compelling second witness to support the Samaritan and Jubilees testimony. So when we see the, the Apocrypha, the Apocrypha are pointing to Samaritan and Jubilees as the correct understanding. Um, and we, we talked also, I've mentioned that the Dead Sea Scrolls has copies of the Torah, which agree with the Samaritan Torah. But the Essenes who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls hated the Samaritans. The, the author of Jubilees, whether it be an actual angel in Moses or, or a later Jew, whoever wrote Jubilees would not have agreed with the Samaritans. They would have despised Samaritans. Samaritans are completely contrary to the theology and religion of Jubilees. And yet, Jubilees agrees with Samaritan. That's a strong... Dead Sea Scrolls agrees with Samaritan. Uh, Jubilees agrees with Samaritan. Enoch, Book of Enoch agrees with Samaritan. All these different things are agreeing with Samaritan. Maybe the reason the Samaritans have their peculiarities is because their Torah actually is better than, than the Jews' Torah. And... But of course, you know, with Samaritans misunderstood certain parts of, of the Torah. So for example, the, in, in our Torah and in theirs, it says Gerizim, Mount Gerizim is the mountain of blessing. It's a holy mountain. Well, if the mountain is holy, where should we build a temple? It makes sense in, you know, in man's thinking, that's a holy, that's a holy place. Let's build a temple on Mount Gerizim. And it even says in their copy of the Torah, Build an altar on Mount Gerizim. In our copies of Torah, it tells us, in the, in the Jews' copy, that is, it tells us, build an altar on that cursed mountain, Mount Ebal. According to the Torah, Mount Ebal is the mountain of cursing. So the Masoretic tells us to build an altar on the cursed mountain? That doesn't make sense. In the Samaritan makes sense to build it on Mount Gerizim. But that doesn't mean that a temple is supposed to be there. It just means a temporary altar is supposed to be there on Mount Gerizim. So it makes more sense that the Samaritan Torah is more accurate. And then over time, uh, the Jews did not like that. They didn't agree with the Samaritans. So they changed the Torah to try to... Um, they didn't want people to, to convert to the Samaritan religion. So they changed which mountain it was. They changed it from the Mountain of Blessing, Mount Gerizim. They changed it to Mount Ebal because they didn't want people to fall away into the Samaritan faith. But the evidence is overwhelming that Samaritan overall, not 100%, but overall, is a more reliable, more accurate version. So I would say, for the most part, my opinion is, throw out the Masoretic for the Torah, it's very much ridiculous, and replace it with the Masoretic text. For my view, the Hebrew behind the Samaritan is far more accurate and reliable most of the time in the in the Samaritan than the Masoretic. So if you have to choose, if I had to choose between the two, I wouldn't hesitate for a second to throw out the Masoretic text completely for the Torah and say, nope, the Torah, get rid of the Masoretic version of Torah. We don't need it. It's, it's useless. It's garbage because we have Dead Sea Scrolls and we have, um, and we have a Samaritan. We don't, we, that's what we need. The Masoretic has almost no value in the Torah. The Masoretic does have value for other books of the, of the Old Testament, but not for the Torah. It's just very um, poorly preserved in the, the actual Hebrew. Another thing is Jubilees agrees with Septuagint and Samaritan in many readings, not just in the genealogies, but in all kinds of differences, like um, different readings of various verses, because Jubilees has parallel passages with Genesis that line up. Sometimes it's almost verbatim, the same verse as Genesis in Jubilees, but when it has the same verses, 
usually Jubilees does not agree with mass aromatic. Usually it agrees with the Samaritan and or the Septuagint. Another thing is the Septuagint has a high agreement with Samaritan Torah. So it's very likely that the Septuagint was derived from a Hebrew copy very similar to the Samaritan version. There is an oversimplification because there are certain things in the Septuagint which are closer to the Samaritan sometimes. I, excuse me. There are things in the uh, Septuagint which are closer to the Masoretic sometimes, I meant to say. So there's a, Septuagint is not always agreeing with the Samaritan for the Torah, but usually it does. But, um, but on occasion, it will agree with Masoretic text for the Septuagint. But all that to say, it's like huge uh, corroboration of the Samaritan. Jubilees is a huge endorsement of the Samaritan version of Torah. And that's, that's significant. That's a huge, hugely significant. So that's one of the major implications of Jubilees being authority to us. If Jubilees is authority, that means the Masoretic text is radically corrupt and the Samaritan is the closer to the original. By no means am I suggesting that the Samaritan is the original, but that it's closer to the original. That's an important distinction. Because there are plenty of things in the Samaritan that are not correct either in Genesis. But we have a Jubilees points us to the closer version of Torah. And you know, my goal is to restore the Torah. So I want to know what's the most accurate readings. And Jubilees helps point us in that direction. Jubilees tells us, okay, Samaritan is a better, more reliable tradition of the Torah. Current, current scholarship of the Torah places heavy preference on Masoretic Torah because of why the Jews preserved it. That's a bias, a huge bias towards the Jews. And I'm not anti-Semitic in any way, shape, or form. I believe the Jews are the holy people. Samaritans are not. But that doesn't mean the Jews are perfect. And all the evidence points to them messing up the, the scriptures a lot. Not necessarily intentionally. Like they didn't intentionally create uh, false stuff. But over time they made mistakes. And the Jews have the most mistakes of all the copies of, of the scriptures from what I can see. Now that leads us to ask why. The question why. Why did the Septuagint, if the Septuagint uh, changed, why did the Septuagint, uh, why are the numbers in the Septuagint 100 years extra? You know, why, why uh, are, is, there discrep is there that discrepancy? I believe the reason for that discrepancy is because of, uh, the reason is, in my view, it makes a lot of sense that the ancient Jews and Christians had a polemic. If you read in the uh, writings of the Church Fathers, for example, Justin Martyr, Justin Martyr was trying to argue that the Bible is older than everything. Moses is older than the Egyptians. You look at the history of other nations, the Egyptians, for example, according to, that, according to their histories, it does not agree with the Bible. It has, for example, it has Egyptian history going back like 3,000 years before, before Messiah. That's not possible with a Masoretic understanding or a Samaritan or Jubilee's understanding. So it's very likely that whoever was a scribe of the, of the Torah, the, the Septuagint version, they're like, well, that can't be. Um, Genesis is inspired, so Genesis must be an error because... It can't, it can't contradict history. So they actually altered Genesis to make it agree with history. I'm very confident. The, the scribes were like, okay, that doesn't make sense. We know Genesis is older, so we have to change the history to make it agree with the other histories of the other nations. So, um, so that uh, to me is a very logical, and that gives a huge motivation. The scribes would not be motivated to change the scriptures to make it contradict history. They would be motivated to change scripture to make it agree with history. Current accepted history, because at that time, and still today, Egyptian history was believed to go back 3,000 years before Christ, before Messiah. Um, I don't personally believe that that's the, that's the case. I think Egyptian history is very likely to be altered and corrupt in certain ways, just like the Bible has been corrupted over time. I, why can't it happen to uh, secular copies too? Secu secular histories could certainly be corrupt as well. 
So I think the, we should be questioning the Egyptian history. But I think the ancients, they accepted the Egyptian history at face value and they were like, okay, that's not good. We need to, we need to make sure people know that uh, the Bible is older than Egyptian history. So they kept adding 100 years to push it back so people would know, okay, um, the Bible is historically accurate. That's a huge motivation. And makes sense. Uh, I don't know what you got. What do you think about that, Jackson? Do you does, do you think that idea makes sense? What's historically accurate? Um, do you think the the idea that the the Egyptian chronology has the Egyptians um, three thousand years before Christ, whereas according to the Masoretic and Samaritan and Jubilees copy of Genesis, um, Egypt only existed like two thousand years after uh, 2000 years before Christ. So that's a thousand year, Egyptian chronology is a thousand years older than it should be according to the, these younger, according to these other Bible copies. So it makes sense that the scribes would be like, wait, um, the Bible's not wrong. The Bible's not historically accurate, inaccurate. So we need to change what it says to make it agree with history. Oh. Well, uh, all I can say about that, I, I have thought about that actually a lot because I have gone back, worked with the genealogies and the Alfie priesthood and that kind of stuff. And the, it's got to be more than a coincidence that the time of Joseph and the time of um, um, Panahasi are just the same and that it's about oh only 200 years different than than what is the given the, the uh, received bible chronology you know what i'm talking about talking um about Akhenaten, not, Akhenaten and all that i know you've mentioned some of that before i'm not fully yeah. familiar with all the details that you've said sure but there's there is evidence that is very strong very very strong evidence that uh, Joseph was uh, in the vizier position during the reign of uh, Akhenaten, and that was uh, beginning in 1350. And along with the Bible chronology, you, you lay that together, and you're not that far off. It, um, I think Abraham's 1800 or so, but that, that varies depending on what source you use. But, yeah. It's oh, like yeah. you say, everything, the Bible is out of Egypt, just like the sun's out of Egypt, the Messiah's out of Egypt, uh, the faith is out of Egypt, and the third temple is undoubtedly out of Egypt. So uh, which, which way would you think? Well, I was, I'll say something, but uh, Governor wanted to say something, I think. Yeah, there's a book by a guy named Emmanuel Velikovsky, um, and he has an idea completely different. Um, I think he goes with the saying that the Egyptian timeline is right idea. And he puts um, the Egyptians leaving, uh, I'm sorry, the Israelites leaving Egypt much earlier than we would. Um, I can't remember all the particulars, but I remember that uh, there was a person who was part of the Yahad for a while who was uh, pretty convinced by his argument. Uh, well, I've got those books. They're in the Yahad library. They're got them in e form actually uh, i'm going to go look in there and see i've They're great inside for a long time wanting to get into them and see some of that chronology chronology that Vilikowski does it's like you i've heard people talk about well this is revolutionary and i just has, hasn't read well it. but it but it assumes that the egyptian chronology is correct yeah yeah now if if it is not then there are some serious issues Either the either the Bible chronology is is um, is inaccurate, or the Egyptian chronology is inaccurate, or they're both inaccurate, and we don't know. You know, like it's very likely that they're both have problems. Uh, it's it's very un unlikely that when it, I've studied in the scriptures, like I, as I said, I'm a scribe and I do the textual criticism, and I've seen. Numbers, the accuracy of numbers are the first thing to go at numbers and people's names. Names and numbers are the first thing to be corrupted. They're very diff they're very easy to correct um, by later copyists, especially, you know, if you're translating into another language, for example. That, 
names get, get garbled up. Now you mean, I, you know, for example, we have Jesus now. Jesus, how did we get from the original Hebrew name, whatever it was, Yeshua or whatever, I'm not going to debate the pronunciation here, but, uh, you know, from a Hebrew name, how do we get to Jesus? You know, I mean, we know how that happened, but it's huge. Like the name got garbled over time. You take Jacob or really Yaakov, Yaakov, it has now become James. That's a huge garbling over time. Jacob, James. So we do see names being messed up over time. We see numbers getting messed up. Rich, did you want to say something? Yeah, I jumped in in the middle, so I have no idea what you guys are talking about. But I would just say two things. One is um, Velikovsky doesn't just take the Egyptian chronology as being correct. He, he takes um, different, uh, different things uh, uh, from around the world, different cultures from around the world. So he shows that the sun standing still was seen in uh, um, tribes across the ocean as – as being dark for a longer period of time, et cetera, et cetera. So he uses natural phenomenon that are recorded in uh, different cultures and matches up those things to where he thinks he can show exactly what year the sun stood still. So if you even get one or two of those dates and you feel like you can lock in on them, then that helps you with the rest of chronology and governor, it might match up with the Egyptian, but I don't think he's just using the Egyptian. Uh, and then uh, second of all, yeah, we, uh, we know how, to, uh, you know, I would say Jesus is a good example of, Ye of Yeshua being garbled. James would be a little different because it was just because of King James and they wanted to impress King James. But anyway, I don't know what we're talking about, so I'll shut up now. Well, I'll just say from my understanding of the whole James thing, it's actually a little bit more comp than just like with the whole thing with King James it's actually I think uh, let me just quickly look that up um, there's a great resource I'd like to use I mean it's kind of like the equivalent of Wikipedia but for the, the dictionary so obviously it can be edited by anyone but generally it's I would say it's pretty reliable oh, yeah. Um, it's yeah yeah I think it's because uh, it was Yaakov Jacobus in Greek and then I don't know where it went after that yeah, uh, basically, so here's how it works. Um, so, okay, so uh, so Greek, as you said, Jacobus. Latin, it became Jacobus. And then in, it's called Vulgar Latin. It was rendered Jacobus. The B changed to an M. Um, and the, the reason for that, B and M are closely related, but and, like, with the lip is very closely related. That's why you see, for example, Nimrod. Um, now look at look at how I'm saying it. Nimrod. Like you could try to try to say it to yourself, Nimrod, and you can almost hear a B in there. Nimrod. Like it's almost like there's a B in there. Like like for example, when you say dumb, D U M B, there's a there's like a B at the end. Nimrod. Well, over time, like in the Septuagint, for example, and in Greek writings in general, they don't say Nimrod. They say knee broad they throw out the m they ignore the m entirely in the hebrew there's the m but they render it n-e-b-r-o-d nibrod that's what happened here with james uh it was jacob jacobus and it became jacobus and then um and then eventually rendered it into a es james uh it would it should be like uh like Jameis or something, you know, the ES, but over time. It what side is that that you're looking at? Oh, uh, that's a Wiktionary. I'll post it in the, you, you, do you see um, where the uh, comment section in, in the Zoom thing? I'm going to post it there. Uh, the chat, the chat section. Yeah, I've, I've got it. I found it. All right. So yeah, uh, James with the number thing and then et etymology. Again, not everything there is accurate, but I, I trust the site a lot. It has good good information there. Definitely check it out for other stuff too. Um, but basically, Rich, what we've been talking about is the genealogies of uh, Jubilees and Genesis. And what we what I presented is evidence that the Samaritan version of Genesis chapter 5 is more accurate than the other versions. And I showed how Jubilees corroborates what, what Samaritan version says. Um, which has huge implications. And then I, I talked about 
I was just going into why the Septuagint, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but the Septuagint adds 100 years extra for each person. You know that, right? Yeah. And we, I was basically saying, why is that the case? And I believe there was a motivation by the scribes because the scribes saw Egyptian history is much older and they didn't want the Bible to be historically inaccurate. They want people to, to believe the Bible is accurate historically. So they would be motivated to add extra years to make it look like the Bible is accurate history. Um, to me, it makes more sense to alter the Bible to make it more historically accurate than to alter the Bible to make it historically inaccurate. Uh, like the scribes would, would not have much motivation to alter, like they want people to accept what the Bible says, so they wouldn't be like, okay, look, history is this, but we're going to intentionally contradict history. It makes more sense that they had their tradition that was very different than the Egyptian tradition, and then the scribes were like, okay, this contradicts accepted history. We don't want people to think the Bible's wrong, so let's change it to make it reflect what's historically accurate. Does Jubilees, um, does Jubilees place uh, Abram as being able to be taught by Seth like uh, Jash Yasher does? No. Um, neither, does Samar uh, neither does the... You I mean don't Shem? Think, did, he, did he say that? Or did he, yeah, Shem. 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 Yeah. Shem. I think oh, I meant okay. Shem. Yeah, yeah, Shem is... Uh, I knew what you meant. Um, and um, that only works for the Masoretic chronology. Um, the, it does not work with Jubilees or the uh, Septuagint or the Samaritan. Um, now, I didn't get into this, but I want to briefly touch on this, and then we'll, we'll end this uh, teaching thing. Um, so, so far I showed how Jubilees, for every single instance, agrees with, with the Samaritan for the the people in Genesis chapter 5 of how old they were uh, when they had their their son. But now, for the people after, in Genesis chapter 11, it goes all the way from, uh, it goes from uh, Shem down to Abram. And there's, Jubilees does not agree at all with any of the witnesses of Genesis. So if some people wanted to argue that Jubilees was just copying the Samaritan Torah, well, if that was the case, then Jubilees would be agreeing with the Samaritan Torah for all these people after the flood too, but it doesn't. Jubilees is completely independent. It's radically different. Um, we have Samaritan agreeing with the Septuagint. Uh, we, we have a similar thing with people after the flood compared to before the flood. We talked about how before the flood there was a hundred year discrepancy for each person typically. The same thing happens for after the flood, but... Uh, is usually 100 years younger for each person, whereas the Septuagint and Samaritan agree that it's 100 years older. Um, so in this case, we have a, a united harmony between the Septuagint and Samaritan, uh, disagreeing with the Masoretic, whereas Jubilees disagree with all, with all three radically. And I'm of the position that Jubilees is correct and that all three why? witnesses... Why? Yeah. Um, because uh, it maps it out uh, like like the way that um, the way that Genesis has it, it just has these numbers. Like it doesn't it doesn't link it to specific time periods. Whereas Jubilees is very specific. Like it, for example, it says in this Jubilee, this week, this year. It's very specific, and not only that, it also like um, maps it out with like the names. So last week, for example, I mentioned how Peleg, like in, in the same thing in Genesis, it says in Jubilees that Peleg was named Peleg because in his day, the earth was divided. Some people theorize that that means the continents literally divided, but according to Jubilees and Genesis Apocryphon, it actually refers to um, when Noah divided the, the earth as an inheritance among his sons by law. And that's, that sh that's a, Peleg's name is a testimony to when that time actually happened. Um, then it says uh, Reu, Peleg's son named Reu. And Reu is an example of, according to Jubilees, his name Reu 
he was named Reu because that was when the Tower of Babel was being built. So Jubilees places Reu's birth when the Tower of Babel was being built. That's a specific, a very specific historical placement. Whereas Genesis does not have any markers to place people's lives. Um, that, that's kind of a, um, a brief thing there. I mean, uh, I, I think that um, I'm not exactly sure why they, uh, the numbers changed in Genesis to, to different numbers than Jubilees, but I think, I think it does have to do with trying to change it to reflect what history, act, what they believed history was, was. and um, like, uh, let's see here, uh, the, I think that with the three witnesses, Masoretic, Samaritan, and Septuagint, I think the Septuagint and Samaritan for the post-flood people, I think that's the earlier version of the Torah than the Masoretic. I think whoever did the Masoretic, I think they saw the Samaritan and Septuagint version, and they're like, that doesn't agree with biblical history, and they changed it by subtracting 100 years to make it closer to the accurate biblical chronology. And when do you date Jubilees to be written? Uh, I accept Jubilees as a face value for what it, what it claims. It claims uh, that uh, Moses, uh, it was revealed to Moses, but that's the original. Whereas, obviously, we, our, our oldest copy of Jubilees, our oldest complete copy is Ethiopian, which is only like, what, a thousand years ago or something like that. So it's very likely that over time, and we do have evidence like in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that there's been changes to Jubilees. And there are errors in Jubilees too. Um, there's mistakes as well. So I'm not saying that everything in Jubilees is accurate, but that I, I we have a, it says we, while the oldest extant copies of Jubilees can be assigned on the basis of the handwriting to about a hundred BC. So there, so scholarship says it's at least a hundred BC, but they think it was written even before that. Yeah, they, they only think it was written, though, like around, like, what, 150 or 200 or something? Well, BC. it's because of Enoch. Since it quotes Enoch, they don't think Enoch was written until about 300 B.C., so they say it can't be older than that. Right. They have all those lines of thinking. I, right. I'm of the view that I think, even if you don't believe that um, they're, you know, even if you don't believe that Enoch was actually written by Enoch, I think it's very likely that, why, why couldn't it have been written in like 400 BC? Like, or like, why? I, I think their, their dating methods are very sure. questionable, in my view. No, what I about agree. the, go ahead. What about the um, Samaritan Pentateuch? Um, uh, who created that? When was it created? Uh, was it created by the 10 tribes, or is it something that just, how did it fall out? How does it shake out? Um, well, we, we don't know exactly, but I did mention how the, the Dead Sea Scrolls has copies of the, of the Torah, which agree strikingly with Samaritan. Um, I mentioned how Septuagint has a lot of similar readings. Jubilees has agreements. Uh, so the tradition of the Samaritan has to go back pretty, pretty anciently, back at least until the Second Temple period. Uh, I believe that, um, I think the Samaritan Torah in its current form is probably only from like second century BC, right around there. Uh, same thing with Masoretic and Septuagint. They're, they're later versions. I think, I think the Torah, like we know according to the various traditions and certain scriptures that Ezra restored the scriptures and restored the Torah. Um, I think the version of the Torah that Ezra restored was very different than the version that any of our copies of Torah preserve. Um, I think the version of, like I've mentioned before in my teachings, you know, the Temple Scroll being the original Deuteronomy. Uh, I think Ezra restored the Temple Scroll, or, you know, not the Temple Scroll, but a copy almost identical to the Temple Scroll for Deuteronomy. Um, but then eventually, um, this different version of Deuteronomy came onto the scene. So how did that happen? I think uh, it either happened, I think either the Samaritans are responsible for this different Torah uh, that we have. Like, um, that it could be like, you, you know, when the uh, Samaritans were, they wanted to join the Israelites in building the temple in according to Ezra and Nehemiah, but they were kicked out. 
because of that, it's very possible that they made their own Torah to reflect their temple because they built their own temple. So they wanted their Torah to reflect their religion. So it's possible they edited it. And then um, I mentioned in last week's, I think it was last week's teaching, um, First Maccabees tells us that all the scriptures were, not all, but most of the copies of scripture were lost during the Maccabean Wars when the Greeks were persecuting them. And it tells us that Judah Maccabee made a call for all Israel and basically said, okay, everybody find the books of scripture and hand them to us so we can preserve them. So during that time, it's very likely that people weren't sure which Torah to accept. So they might've been more likely to accept the altered Torah during that time of chaos where everyone's like, where's the scriptures? Where are the scriptures? We need the copies of scripture. Um, but it is also possible that the Torah was altered um, by the Jews to support their oral traditions. It's not clear exactly. Um, but either who, whoever came up with the Samaritan Torah, um, I believe that the Samaritan Torah and the Masoretic text are linked. Like I think the Masoretic Torah is derived from the Samaritan uh, version over time. So either, either the Jews took the Samaritan version of Torah during the Maccabean time, or the Samaritans took it from the Jews during, it's, it's one or the other, I think. It's, it's, it's my theory, I don't have proof necessarily, but I think it's the most likely thing that I can come up with at this time. Uh, but yeah, Samaritan Torah, as we know it, doesn't exist, it doesn't exist prior to Ezra. I'm very confident it does not exist prior to that time. Okay, um, yeah, that's, I think that's going to have to be it for this week. We'll have to wrap it up because we got something else we need to tend Sure thing. To. Yeah, it's pretty much it. So next week we'll continue probably with Abraham. Uh, we're, going, we're doing this series on Jubilees Rich. So um, this is like our fifth or sixth video. So we'll, we'll continue next week hopefully and go through Abraham, Abraham's life. All right. Um, so thanks for everybody who came to uh, listen. And this, of course, will go up on YouTube here shortly um jackson did you want to say something yeah i just want to say another excellent job thank you you're welcome any more any questions or things you want to say you can always say it on facebook all right guys thanks it was great shalom guys you have a good you have a good day so, all right you too